What's Trending, presented by Feastbox, donating 10% of every order to Full of Hope, a charitable organization that helps feed hungry families. Jason, you just heard Nick Robinson. We spoke to him yesterday about the non-conference schedule for BYU men's basketball. We know the layout of the 13 games before they take on what will undoubtedly be the most difficult conference stretch in the history of BYU basketball with 18 Big 12 games projected to face 14 quad one and quad two teams in the conference schedule alone. That's crazy. Okay. I mean, just an unbelievable uptick in the challenge right there. But we look at the non-conference schedule and there are only a couple of projected quad one games. In fact, let's hear from Nick Robinson right now a little bit more about how the quad one opportunities line up in the non-conference. We had 13, right, total quad one and quad two games last year. Total quad one and total, quad two. Quad one and quad two, the entire season, right? This year, right, we're projected to have 14 total, right, quad one what? games. Yeah, not oh two, right? Goodness. You know, 12 in league, two in non-conference, with another seven, right, so a total of 21 quad one and quad two. 21 quad one and quad two quite the upgrade so i misspoke a little bit he said 14 total quad one projected 12 in conference and then the two in non-conference and for those that aren't aware of the quadrants here's your 101 class on this every ncaa men's basketball game is broken down into one of four quadrants the toughest games are quad one then next toughest is the tier quad two quad three and quad four and so forth BYU's got a bunch of quad three and quad four games in the non-conference, Jason, and most of those are at home. So they haven't exactly ramped up the non-conference. Do they need to? Yeah. And more importantly, do you feel like the way that it is laid out is adequate to get BYU ready for Big 12 play? Well, let's, let's be honest here. The NBA released its schedule yesterday. If BYU wanted to play some of those teams, maybe that would adequately prepare them <laughs> for what they're going to face in the Big 12. Look, I, I'm not necessarily so sure. I like what BYU did here, and, and we talked about this yesterday on the show. The fact that they have so many home games, I, I think that's going to yep. lend itself. Uh, lend, BYU, I think, can help itself significantly in getting on a roll. And, and I don't necessarily, I mean, I certainly expect them to win a lot of those non-conference games. But I, I think from a confidence standpoint, I think that could really help BYU go into conference play. Regardless of how conference play plays out, I think getting on a roll, knowing what you have, integrating some new pieces, some new key pieces you know, into this roster. And, who, and we don't even know if the roster's done. There's still scholarships that are open and available. And so there's probably still some additions that will come. So I, I think that the non-conference... I don't know if you're ever adequately prepared for what you're going to face in the number one college basketball conference in the nation. Yeah. But I like the opportunity for BYU not to have to travel very much, that you can sort of focus. The other part about being at home as often as they are, it lends to more practice time. You're not using up a day or, a, you know, getting back super early in the morning and then you're sort of sluggish the next day for practice. I think that is a major benefit for what BYU has done in their non-conference, being able to play so many in Provo mm -hmm. or certainly within close proximity to Provo because you have the, the true road game. The only true road game in non-conference is at Utah. Yeah. So we're talking 45 miles north. You've got a, a, a neutral site game at the Delta Center. So you're not traveling very much, and that will help you to be able to have more practice time. And that's what the coaches want. They love to see what these teams do in games. Sure. But they, they make their mark, and I th think they feel like they make their greatest strides in those practice opportunities. This type of non-conference schedule will give them more of that type of opportunity. We used to sometimes just shamelessly poke fun at our friends at St. Mary's because every non-conference schedule, it felt like in the last 10 years that the Gales would put together had them maybe leaving the state of California once. And if they weren't leaving the state of California, everything was in the Bay Area or maybe there was yeah. like a trip to Southern California. And we were like, whoa, don't hurt yourselves too much traveling all the way to Southern California. But frankly, BYU needs this yeah. now. They're not in the West Coast Conference anymore, so I can still feel validated in poking fun at St. Mary's. Because for BYU, it was we got to go and challenge ourselves in the non-con so that we can create a resume that is good enough at the end of the season that hopefully these teams that we play and maybe beat are 
still in a place where they have good metrics and we can get into the NCAA tournament. There's no more of that. There's no more like hoping that the schedule will be tough enough. It's just going to be tough enough already if BYU only played its conference games. Like that would be enough. Yeah. But yes, the St. Mary's model for BYU this year with the nine home games, you've got, uh, or is it 10? 10 home games. You've got your neutral side against Fresno State. No, that's, that's right. Nine home games, neutral side against Fresno State, and then you have the MTE, which is neutral in Las Vegas, right? Yes. Okay. Either way, if it's 12 or 13, the majority are home. As To your point, BYU will not have to travel a ton, and the trips that they do make are short. Las Vegas, in many ways, is BYU's home away from home. I love the balance. I love how it's spread out. Very few back-to-back -back scenarios outside of the multi-team event in Las Vegas. So, yes, home comforts, your own bed, your own annex. Like, BYU's just not going to have to travel a ton. But the thing I like the most is probably what happens from mid-December until December 30th when BYU closes things out against Wyoming. And that is almost like this runway to create yeah. momentum. Yes. BYU should be heavily favored in all of those games in December. Okay, specifically, you look at Denver on December 13th, Georgia State on the 16th, then there's some time for finals for the students, and then it's Bellarmine, I believe. Bellarmine. I, I heard Bellarmine and Bellarmine, so one of the two was right. On December 22nd, shout out to Louisville, Kentucky, and Bellarmine, and the Wyoming Cowboys on December 30th. BYU should be, I think at worst, on a four-game win streak as they begin Big 12 Conference play. And then if they win at Utah on December 9th, then it's a five-game or maybe even more than that of a win streak. And I like that runway to yes. create momentum. That's probably my favorite part of the non-conference schedule aside from just having space and time to breathe in between games and practice, the runway to create momentum for Big 12 play. The other thing, and this goes to what Coach Robinson was discussing, you know, in the sound bites that we just played, because you're playing so many quad one and quad two games, most of which are coming in your conference schedule, mm -hmm. You don't need to beat yourself up in the non-conference. It's the exact same argument that we talk about when, when we discuss the, the scheduling future for BYU football. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm on record as, look, if you're playing nine conference games, I think those three non-conference games before, before Big 12 play, I, I'm scheduling three wins. So you're not scheduling any more Power Fives? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not scheduling Power Fives in the first three anymore if it's up okay. to me. Okay. Because my, my whole thing is I want to make sure I'm healthy heading into the games that really matter. Yes. You don't need to out-schedule yourself for basketball in the non-conference because your conference schedule is just littered with teams that are going to help with the quad one, quad two. You're going to get a bump just for playing the games. Yeah. You don't need to beat yourself up in non-conference. My path for BYU to get into the NCAA tournament, or at least beyond the bubble, was to go 11-2 and two in non-conference play. I think they have a schedule in front of them, Jason, that will allow them to go 11 and 2 at worst 10 and 3 because i feel like BYU has to get to 17 wins overall in the regular season let's say BYU goes 11 and 2 in non-conference play and then they win 6 big 12 games like going 6 and 12 in the big 12 sounds terrible on the surface does it not like 6 and 12 that's awful i remind you that iowa state last year went 7 and 11. I always say went 7 and 11 in conference play last year, okay? They were a 6 seed in the NCAA tournament, going 7 and 11. Mm -hmm. That's how good the conference is. If BYU can go 11 and 2 in non-con, which I think they can do, and they can find a way to win 6 games in conference, they will be bubblicious. That is very exciting. I like the prospect of that. I like that BYU only has two projected quad one games, and who knows if those will even be quad ones. Right. I don't know. Like, it's probably San Diego State at home and at Utah. They're the two projected, like, quad one games. But, hey, win one of those, Jason. Find a way to go 11-2 and two in non-conference play where BYU should be the, the clear favorite in the majority of those, those games that are majority uh, at home. Now you got a shot to be bubblicious. And I think that's, a, like, that's good enough for me. That's, that's a major step in the right direction based off of what happened the last two years when you finished fifth in the West Coast Conference. Before we move on to some football, we do have some breaking news regarding BYU men's basketball. And they it. have made the hire of the assistant coach. 
Um, they just announced uh, on social media, BYU head men's basketball coach Mark Pope announcing the addition of Colin Terry okay. to the Cougars coaching staff um, as the fourth assistant coach. I'm just kind of uh, perusing this briefly. Uh, Terry joins the Cougars after spending the past two seasons as an assistant coach for the Greensboro Swarm. That's the G League affiliate of the Charlotte Hornets. Okay. Uh, it also looks like um, there is some local ties. Terry was an assistant coach at Salt Lake Community College. Uh, under current uh, Utah Valley head coach Todd Phillips. So there's certainly uh, some, uh, some local ties there as well. But BYU has filled, BYU men's basketball, has filled its uh, assistant coaching vacancy okay. with the hire of Colin Terry. Outstanding. Okay, so uh, strength and conditioning is all set in yep. place. Went to the NBA for Ops that. Ops is set. Yeah, Ops is set. And now your third assistant, yes. which was an additional. It wasn't like an assistant coach left for somewhere else. Correct. Like BYU just decided to add one This is the fourth assistant. assistant. The fourth assistant. Yeah, fourth assistant. Yes. Okay, Colin Terry, welcome to BYU there Men's you Basketball. Go. There you go. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk some football. Yesterday we found out via social media from Micah Harper himself uh, that he's done for the season due to a knee injury. Certainly not what you're wanting to hear from anybody, it's, let alone... It's devastating. Yeah, let alone somebody of his caliber at a position... Uh, that BYU, quite frankly, does not have a ton of depth. Um, how big of a deal is this? This is a big deal, especially when one of his very close and talented teammates that also play in the secondary, and I'm going to leave names out of this because I don't want to put quotes on specific players, but uh, I'll tell you that it came from somebody in the secondary that's going to play, said, I feel like we just lost our best overall defender, and that is tough to deal with and tough to overcome. And this means more playing time for those guys in the secondary because Mike is out. But they were not viewing it as, oh, well, I have a you know greater opportunity to step in and play more. No, it was just like melancholy and a super bummer because they know what Micah Harper could potentially mean to this team mm -hmm. as they move into the Big 12. I think he's one of the most physical and one of the most violent, and by violent, I mean violent in a wonderful way in the game of football players that BYU has. And... He's, he's had this happen before. Yeah. Like, an ACL has happened before to Micah. So it's like, why? Why again? It feels unfair. It is what it is. But I loved his post. I loved his social media response. We're going to be happy to see him back on the field in 2024 when BYU is in year two of Big 12 play. But there's no way around this, Jason. This one hurts. Um, and hurt being the operative word there to lose Micah Harper because I tend to agree. I think he's one of BYU's better overall defenders on the entire side of that entire 11-man defense. Yeah, I mean, just in, in general terms, you, you never want to lose a starter at any position before the season even starts. And then let alone a, a position where the depth probably isn't there as much as it is at other positions. I mean, guys that you're, we're looking at now who will be sort of thrust into more playing time or bigger roles, you're talking about guys like Talon Alfrey, Ethan Slade, Raider, Raider yes. DeMooney, Tanner Wall. Those are the guys that you're, that you're looking at. Yeah. But to lose a guy to, to what you said, who's so physical at such an important position in the secondary, that, that is just a big, big loss. There's just no way to sugarcoat it. The other part that I, I want to touch on that you brought up is the fact it's the second time. And, and that's concerning. It's concerning for him um, because we know how important he is, and you never want to have to go through that at all, let alone yeah. a second time. Well, and I, I want to give credit to Malik Moore and Talon Alfrey specifically because because I feel like Malik, not just based on the Micah Harper injury, but before this, he was starting to play more physical mm -hmm. and a chip on his shoulder, and, and Malik had really ramped up his play in camp, and Talon Alfrey as well. Like, those two guys, Jason, like, they, they're bona fide starters, both of them. Like, Micah Harper, Talon Alfrey, Malik Moore, like, those, those three guys were going to play the majority of the reps of the two safety positions, straight up. Now it's just the two for the two, and is it more Ethan Slade? Is it Tanner Wall, who's a converted wide receiver? Or is it Raider, young Raider DeMooney, yeah. who the coaches are super high on, but he is young. Like, is BYU ready to rely on that type of youth? I, I, th I think they'll probably go more with Ethan Slade and Tanner Wall, and then it's Raider. But I hate that BYU has to even consider that yeah. at this point. I hate that they lost Micah Harper, and we wish the best in him, clearly. Like, we love Micah. Great, great young man. 
and we wish him a speedy and healthy recovery so that he can get back and be fully healthy and, and give it a go in 2024. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better. All right, our question of the day as we move from football back to basketball specifically and the non-conference schedule. When you look at the non-conference slate, do you feel like it is adequate to prepare BYU for Big 12 conference play and the toughest college basketball conference in all the land? You tell us. Jason, I never let you read the first tweet. You read the first tweet. Okay, let's go with uh, on X uh, from True Blue, BYU 1984. It's a good non-conference schedule, but nothing will prepare us for our first Big 12 basketball season. Nothing? Ah, is there is there anything that can prepare BYU? Well, you know how yesterday when the when the screen, we put up the full screen and it looked like the BYU was playing the UConn Huskies first? <laughs> if they were to schedule UConn for and game, San Diego State, that, that back may, back. I don't know, that may prepare. There's some, that's hilarious because San Diego State and UConn played in, in the, the national, national championship yeah. last Pretty year. Pretty crazy, So, huh? yeah, just when I saw those graphics, I was like, I'm sorry, is BYU opening up against the two teams that played for the national title? <laughs> oh, no, it's Houston Christian. Okay, very good.